So Dr. Siva, I would love to ask you something that we ask all of our guests. When was the first time that you felt something on a soul level? This is going to really surprise you. But the first time I really felt something on a soul level was actually dissecting my first cadaver in anatomy in med school. Because uh, I was raised in this like Hindu household, but we had the Quran, we had the Bible. My dad was a little bit like fluid in the study of religions, even though at home we practice Hinduism. And then because it was really the only private school structure available back then, I went to these private Catholic schools since, you know, kindergarten, since the beginning. So it was very, like, interesting and silly to me, all of this religion stuff back then. <laughs> and uh, it still is very interesting and silly to me, but <laughs> the spirituality <laughs> part kicked in when really seeing what a freaking miracle it is that like we even function and are alive and that there is this animating force and how everything is coordinating in this incredible rhythm and synchrony it really is a microcosm of the universe inside of us you know so that was the first time i was like oh oh there might be something bigger than this and like you know had a little Oh, okay. What is that? I love that. And when do you feel like that transition happened of tuning into that more spiritual side to you in medical school um, and then kind of transitioning into spirituality more in your everyday with choosing sciences like Ayurveda? Oh, it was definitely something that happened over a few years because in medical school, I was really coding it as a disenchantment with healing and how we were approaching healing in Western medicine. And not, I can't really say that I could separate out that sort of awakening of like, well, how are things done on a systemic level? And does this make sense to me? And am I questioning that authority? Kind of goes hand in hand with like, what is the bigger picture here and what have I been taught and how am I questioning and discovering that for myself, right? So that was definitely happening. And then um, after med school, I went into international public health and development. So I had the good fortune to live in many different places in the world for these like stints of time where I got to like get to know the people, the cultural, and the, the societal drivers and really try to create health infrastructure programs that were tailored. And in that experience, you know, when you're seeing so many different cultures and so many different people, it like really broadens your horizons to a whole nother level from like just having the Indian and the American as my two vantage points, right? So I felt like that was a really important part of like seeing the oneness in everything um which definitely played a big role in like my personal spirituality and then simultaneously led me to see the power of indigenous healing systems you know in these places where there really isn't a lot of health infrastructure and the common threads between all these different ancient healing systems there's so many you know um ayurveda is just one of many but all of them are essentially saying the same things and so that really moved me. And then the reason I chose Ayurveda to study, well, obviously like my cultural background and I was very interested in it. My, um, my grandmother had just passed and she was 96, I believe. Oh. And my um, daughter was four months old. And even before, like when I was pregnant, I was remembering my grandmother flew here from India and moved here. She basically emigrated when I was born and she lived with us and raised me until she went to my uncle's house and helped to raise his kids, my cousins. And, you know, there was always a remedy. There was always a thing. It was always hands and something from the kitchen, <laughs> you know, 
And my mom went clearly the other way because, you know, that's poor village medicine. And now we're in America and you just take a pill for everything and it's fast and easy. Right. So uh, it was definitely like a craving of like, where is that, you know, where is that run to the kitchen for something like, you know, Amma's not here to do that anymore. So let me learn a little bit more about it. But then what I found in it that I haven't found in any other sort of natural healing system is a process of empowerment and self-realization, you know, and that really is a spiritual journey in and of itself too. So I can't really separate out Ayurveda and, you know, the self-growth and the, the spiritual growth aspects, but it all kind of went hand in hand like that. I'm curious when you were working with and living with other cultures, did you find that even the ones that really stuck to more of their like indigenous wisdom, that they still had more of that like masculine energy? Or did you find that in some of those cultures it like kept more of the feminine and more of that like grandma in the kitchen energy to it? Both. Mm -hmm. Both. I definitely saw like... Um, because a lot of these cultures, like even Hinduism, take it like ever since like the Manu transcript and like sort of more orthodox Hinduism, like women were removed from the temple space. Women were considered dirty with their period and all these things shifted that weren't the case beforehand. So I do think like the rise of patriarchal patterns and um, shifts affected all of these ancient sort of practices. And so what we see, what I saw was definitely like post-colonialization, post-patriarchy in most places. Um, and that made a big difference. So you definitely saw a lot of like, oh, this is the sort of village doctor and there is a lot of fear base and control and some stuff going on. And then also I saw cultures where very much so like all the mothers grew certain things and everyone knew how to make certain teas and it was a living breathing sort of you know kind of in the house of women and creation and food and nourishment and and all of that so both I said both I think it's so interesting to look at the influence of you know, the masculine and the feminine on each other. And I think sometimes in America, I picture like other cultures and they're just like living by this ancient wisdom in a really feminine way. And like, that's not the truth because there's been so much globalization. So it's interesting to hear your perspective. And I'd love to dive. You talked a little bit about your transition from med school and then kind of coming back to Ayurveda and studying that. But what was your catalyst for discovering the more feminine form Ayurveda or Ayurveda in a more authentic way to you? Oh my God, of course, it's always some jerk, right? <laughs> <Always>. <laughs> and like I was doing this three-year program. I probably shouldn't say which one it is. And uh, I was pregnant right before signing up for the program. As I mentioned, I think I actually... I know Zaya... Excuse me, it's all big blur, but... I remember coming back from maternity to my program and having to take like a little bit of a time off for, for having the baby and bringing her to class and stuff. And um, it, the thing is, I was very rare in that I had an MD already coming in and a master's in public health. So it was very educated sort of student for a, um, you know, a, a three-year Ayurvedic certificate program in California. You know what I mean? And um, my teachers definitely, some of them showed that they were very threatened by that and it was challenging for them. And then I'm very questioning sort of like vocal person as it is. And, um, and if you're not a very like, solid strong teacher and you're just regurgitating stuff because you're in a pyramid scheme it's not a good fit no so 
they basically like gave me all these ridiculous hoops and like bureaucracy and um I remember like my final project was not accepted because he said I didn't format my Excel spreadsheets correctly. And then I redid everything and he said, oh, well, at this point, I'm just not giving you the certificate, even though you finished the work, even though you scored in the 90s, and even though you've turned in the project. And if you want, you can sign up for the program and repay for the whole thing again, because now we've changed our rules and just some bullshit, you know? So it really made me look at like, this is so not Ayurvedic. Like this is not, something's not right here, you know? And it felt very masculine in the sense of like, this is linear. It's based on these like rules. The rules are based on money. And really, where is the heart of like what we're really embodying and paying attention to energetics and energetic patterns and the fluidity and the appreciation of context and the individualization that is the heart of Ayurveda, right? So that was the first time where I was like, oh, oh something is interesting here and it, and it really didn't feel good. It took me some time to sort of dissect the experience, right? And then because of that certification, then some of my teachers went on to become very prominent people in the National Ayurvedic Medical Association board and such. And it really turned me off to the whole thing because then I've been practicing and I'm applying for this grandfathering and whatever. I've got my case studies. My clients are doing amazing. I'm two and a half years into practice. And they denied, the same people denied my application. And it was just like, okay, what is this? What, what's the message here from the universe for me, right? Because I really do believe as a part of my spiritual belief system that everything happens for a reason and for my greater good. And sure enough, it was because I realized, oh my goodness, I don't want to be controlled, just like I didn't want to be controlled by the medical board about like, literally what I'm allowed to say and not to say to people, how I'm allowed to help them. It was such a limitation and such a, like sucked all the art out of healing, you know, like a monkey can do this on an iPad now. And it <laughs> felt like the same thing where it was like, I don't want to be beholden to like all this arbitrary sort of, it feels like a very patriarchal model. And that was the beginning of my freedom because now I say what I want as I sorry you already experienced me cursing like I really have no um one to answer to do you know I don't claim myself to be an Ayurvedic practitioner I don't even need you I don't need your certificate I don't need any of that because who I am is who I am and what my dharma is is what my dharma is and ain't nothing you can do about that and for me to come into that I needed those jerk experiences right yeah totally um you can curse out here by the way we love it because we've that authentic yeah. voice that we need um i you know can relate to that in my own way my own experience and it is so it's almost funny you can look at it from this perspective of like it's an intuitive science like yes we have principles we have the elements but it dances it moves so for you to say it has to be abc I'm almost certain, I can't say for positive, but the ancient Rishis didn't download that as a message for everyone, that we had to like cross our T's and dot our I's in a specific way. It's an intuitive science that you have to, it, it channels through you in a different way. So I like totally agree with that on so many levels. And I think like, it's interesting because as Ayurvedic practitioners go through this process, and I think, I don't know, you can relate to this in a lot of things in life. There has to be that like training wheels phase, and then you have to take off the training wheels and see how it works in your own body and mind and validate it through your own experience, which in my ex experience too, and learning the Vedas, that's what it's about. You can only, truth can be validated through your direct experience. And all the knowledge that we are given, it's supposed to be dynamic by nature. It's supposed to dance and be relative to the current times and what is relative to your own self, to your own vessel. So I'm so curious to see what 
And that once you came to that realization and perspective, did you start to see, okay, now I can become a creation of how Ayurveda wants to breathe through me. What rituals can I let go of? What were some of those rituals? You know, it wasn't really like rituals so much. It was rules. Mm -hmm. Because Ayurveda is very much taught in a rule-based sort of fashion. So, you know, that's when I really started looking at, you know, like, okay, how am I working with my clients? I'm analyzing their constitutions and this, that, and the other. And I'm not sure if either of you read my book, but it's definitely revolutionary in that I, I call out this constitution-centric approach in a way that I haven't seen anyone else do. And what I essentially say is, this is outdated. This is no longer relevant for us because when this science was created, people didn't have a lot of change in their lives. I mean, really, you were born in the same place, you're going to die with the same people doing the same things. And so it makes sense that your constitution would be a much bigger driver of what we're looking at in terms of disease and imbalance. But in this day and age, that's not the case at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And so in the book, I make this argument and it was a, it was a significant departure from traditional Ayurveda. And that departure made me really understand too how much of it had become rule-based because of, I think, like the post-colonial trying to fit into the Western medical context once, you know, after being illegal for 300 years in the country and resurfacing in these like medical institutions and also Western mass marketing, right? So, oh, if you're a pitta, eat this. If you're a vata, buy this. If you're this, do this, you know, like type yourself, live this way. And that's really how everyone came to me all the time. Like, oh, well, I did the quiz and I'm a this. And I go, okay, well, you're, you know, <laughs> there's a quiz that's going to tell you what you are and how to eat and this or that like that's just not that's not real and so with my clients and students really teaching them to learn how to read learn how to listen like there's this constant feedback being given to us by every one of our tissue systems and most importantly our emotional body as a whole another form of intelligence right and so are we in this beautiful communion with ourselves are we in the yoga with ourselves right of like okay where am i at what do i need and that's kind of another seminal message that i started playing with once i made the departure of no ayurveda really for me is a living breathing practice of where am i at what do i need which is very much so based on Vikriti. It's entirely based on Vikriti, right? So that those were some significant departures, like leaving the constitution-centric thing, leaving the rule-based format, really flourishing this practice of being fully able to know what is energetically best for us in any given decision, whether that's what we're having for lunch or who we're going to sleep with, you know, like... These, it's all energetics and so to be able to really know this is what's best for me in any given choice wow there is no form of power greater than that that like that is an empowerment process and so for that reason i've been presenting ayurveda as a system of empowerment it, this is much more than just taking some natural herbs instead of a drug right so does that answer your question <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um, I'd say like, we are so guilty of this. And from the other lens, like the practitioner lens, like the marketing, we, we see that so much when we post on Instagram and we talk about the doshas, people connect with that. And when they sign up to work with us, it's like, what's my constitution? It's like, actually, we can help you more when we figure out like, what's going on in your life? What is your vicar tea? Like, tell us what's happening. And I think there's this disconnect and like, that's what people connect with. It's kind of like astrology, like what's my sun sign. And then like, maybe the astrologer could take them through the whole chart. But like, I'm curious, the the kind of journey you've taken with your clients and calling in people who are ready to almost like acknowledge that power in themselves. I don't know if you see this, but sometimes like you tell people like you have all you need to listen in to your intuition and like figure out what your body needs. And people are like, 
<laughs> it's almost like they don't want that answer, right? It's like, oh, wow, that's too much. So what has your journey been with that and calling in the people who are ready to do that work and take that personal responsibility? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting because from the beginning, I might have attracted a little bit of a unique subset because I do have the MD. And so there's a lot of people out there who are very curious and interested in alternative healing approaches, but don't have the confidence to do so, especially when they have a diagnosis, but then they're more driven to really like show up and do the work and make the changes because they have a diagnosis. So I attracted a lot of that in the beginning. So right from the beginning, I had very committed clients, but they were often like with a lot, like, so in the beginning, I had a lot of people who had serious autoimmune diseases and cancer and, you know, like a few meds they were taking regularly because I guess that's, that's who I was meant to help at that time. And that was also probably there to further prove to myself the power of what's possible with changing the way we make choices, right? So also for anyone that learns with me, whether it's in Shakti school or in the book or whatever, I'm always drawing out sort of the understanding of, okay, we're looking at all of the qualities that are present inside of us. And then we're looking at all the qualities and energetic patterns that are happening in the container of our lives, right? That we're taking in to embody those energetics. And so ultimately, if we're feeling a pattern or a set of qualities, signs and symptoms, if you will, then it's indicative that something in our lives is off. You know, we're choosing in a way where we're bringing in qualities in a way that's not feeling good to us, right? So how are we going to shift that? It's going to require a change in the way we make choices. And a change in the way we make choices is going to require rewiring thoughts and belief systems that were driving the default choices that come from the childhood imprint, right? And that that process is inherent in the work that I do with clients because otherwise it's easy to tell people to choose in a different way. It's easy to inspire them to want to. Most of them already come to you wanting to, but they need clear reframing a clear set of new perspectives, a supported process of building the awareness to see the old perspectives and thoughts and beliefs that led to the existing patterns. And then to have some time to really work with rerouting, rewiring, recoding, reworking how the back end is and then actually choosing differently and then actually experiencing the benefit of the new experience that they've cultivated based on the the new choices. And that's when I take the training wheels off, right? So I've found my way around this because the container of my work is a long-term intimate relationship. And, and that's rare. So a lot of practitioners do like a one-off session or something like that. And when people come to me, I tell them like, look, this is a year minimum that we're likely going to be working together because it takes that long for you to learn your patterns, learn how to modulate them, experience the benefit of the modulation and feel confident enough to do it on, on your own, right? So I think the, the container of the work um, is definitely how I've best gotten around that and made it something that's possible. Um, another side thing that I saw in some of your pre-show questions, just to tie this in, is alongside, if we're talking about changing decision-making, right? So I just gave you one half of it, which is really looking at the basis of why do we choose in the way we choose and, and what does that lead to? And A lot of that is sort of like uh, cognitive behavioral psychology sort of approaches, right? Building the awareness, applying the awareness is how we define spiritual growth in the Vedas. So already in and of itself, if you're building the awareness and you're applying it, you're you're growing your, your spirit, your consciousness, your vibrational state, right? 
but the other piece that's been missing that I found I had to add in and now has become kind of a new, really juicy focus for me in my work is realizing that it's not just about looking at the stuff in our brains and how we make decisions and working on that level. What people were missing, including myself, is knowing what the hell to do with the emotions. No one knows, you know, and and if you guys had my class in Shakti school where we went over psycho-spiritual wellness, that's definitely so important to teach this stuff because we have this intelligence, right? So it's like, if you're born with your mental intelligence and you're born with emotional intelligence, why would you only use one of them? <laughs> you know, and nobody's saying you need to drop your mental intelligence, your logical reasoning entirely or your strategy just to be making decisions based on the whim of emotions or something like that, which is how it gets characterized with that whole patriarchal like overlay, right? Like it's hysterical, it's, you know, kind of um, fickle, it's not trustable, all of these things like trust the science, the experts, the data, the, the whatever, right? And I feel like this is the root of every bad decision that has ever been made in humankind <laughs> is to suck out the, if the feeling, the basis of it right so we want it to be that our emotional intelligence is guiding us to the right direction and defining north for us if you will like you know really this is what is needed and then the mental intelligence is then reasoning out and strategizing how do i get myself there Right. And so they're working together and we're bringing all of our intelligence to be aligned. I talk a lot about congruency and alignment behind our choices. Right. So that work of really being able to step into empowerment or really being able to shift, like transform entirely how you're receiving and responding to life does involve the recoding of the default patterns, but that's just almost like mental and neuroplasticity, right? In addition, it involves learning to understand your deeper emotional needs and how your feelings are messengers and building your emotional awareness and applying that awareness for emotional intelligence and then learning to make the decisions where all of that is working together for you to make a decision that you can wholly feel good about. Mm, we're obsessed with this. And one of the things that we love to talk about is like, there's so much content out there. And I feel like everyone talks about like the food and herbs and things like that. But like, this is like such a crucial part. Like one of the things we love so much, cause it actually like drives the needle forward for people. And it's like, you can give people all the knowledge, all of the content, all of like the right and perfect healing plans all day long, but unless they understand how to actually shift their behavior and why, and like emotionally what's going on, then those habits either aren't going to last or they're, they're not going to even begin in the first place. So love all of this. I'm so curious, like what type of like knowledge or science do apply to that? Like, is that where the MD comes in? Is it more Ayurveda or like, how do you work with the emotional body? No, I don't. I mean, I am a psychiatrist by training. So definitely like there is psych background in there. Before that, I got my undergrad degree in neuroscience and really looking at how people make decisions. In fact, it was, um, my thesis was on gender differences in decision making. And then in public health, I was really focused on health behavior change. So why do we make the choices that we make that lead to various health outcomes? So in a way, I was always floating around this. And I really do think it's just my dharma. But if I think about like what I know and what I teach, I didn't learn any of that in any of those places. Like it, this is really just what was gifted to me to share in this lifetime. And I, I don't have any academic substantiation for it, even though I have academic substantiation 
for me, <laughs> I don't. And so it's been really exciting because I'm creating these models and it's coming from all of my years in practice working with people. It's coming from my own personal growth journey and this work in my own life and building models and ways to share it and teach it with other people and then watching them do it and refining. So I really do feel like super blessed that it, it's been an original creation for me. And, mm -hmm. and I know it's like kind of hot now in Ayurveda and I really see like, first of all, I see people reposting, like taking my content and just tweaking it and putting it out there all the time. And I get annoyed and then I'm like, okay, it's fine. It's, it's good. It's getting out there more. But I do think that like anything, it's very easy to take words and sound like, you can walk the, the, you can talk the talk. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, like, I think like we need to look out for that with Ayurveda, with yoga, with spirituality in general, anyways, like there's a lot of people out there talking about emotional wellness or relationship wellness or self-empowerment in ways that are very like uh, confusing and like, it's just the right words, but it's not with the right process or underpinnings in a weird way do you know what i'm saying totally. like wrong energy yeah. Yeah. it's like the intention and like understanding of it is not there because if it was you would be able to like link it back to it it's just like a lot of esoteric like in the space and it's i feel like sometimes it's disheartening if that's someone's first introduction to this because they're like no meaning no common ground how am i supposed to logically understand that but i think that's also i was talking about this with a friend yesterday actually like it is kind of cool. I do feel like intuitively, since people are waking up more, that they can intuitively know when someone is truthful and they'll just be drawn to their aura for that reason. But on the other hand, you do have to be aware because if people are new into this, they don't necessarily have that aligned mind emotions that you were talking about. They need someone to get them there to align that. And something that I... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go sorry. On. I wanted to also clarify, like, it's not just like that there are these like people out there with just the candy coated shelf and not the chocolate inside, you know, but also there, there are like amazing people putting work out there that I think we ourselves too, like I think of how long I stayed in my unhealthy marriage dynamic because I was in this new age world where it was like, you should be able to be happy anywhere. True happiness comes from within, mm -hmm. for example, right? And then like really working on myself and working at like, why can't I be happy in this? And what's wrong with me? And I need to try harder when, wait, this is overtly not a healthy energetic. You can see it, you can articulate it. There wasn't anyone to walk me through like, yes, you can cultivate happiness inside of yourself and in any situation but people go to mountaintops to do this work <laughs> and definitely to keep yourself in a container in which you are regularly being triggered is not going to be supportive to your true emotional wellness and growth so if you want to do that growth and you want to learn how to emanate that happiness from within go put yourself in a container that is supportive of that work don't it's not possible to do it in this container there was no one to give me that bigger picture and we're holding on to these sort of you know memes if you will that we get on like you know oh that's toxic positivity oh that's spiritual bypassing oh that's this like we're just so quick to label this that or the other without the ability within ourselves or with the people we're working with to truly be able to apply it to this specific case and context. Because if there's anything that we all love about Ayurveda that I can tell from just the few minutes talking to you, it's the fact that it is fluid and, and malleable to the current context, right? So is it is this healing? Well, in this context, yes. In this context, no. Like, how are we to sort through that? I think it's essential to learn that skill to be truly emotionally well and to help other people really get it too, no? Totally. And I like how even when you're saying like it is just purely based on intuition, how I develop my own system of understanding the mind and emotions because 
when you think about the moon and connecting women to their wisdom, the moon represents mind and emotions, and ultimately it's connecting us back to our truth and our intuition. And I mean, yeah, you can call the moon its own science, but like that, you don't need a certificate to understand it. Like you just have to tap into your internal rhythms um, in your own way. So I would love to hear what moon like practices or rituals or principles that you love to teach to your women and connecting them to their intuition. Oh my God. Yeah. You guys have got to join one moon cycle together, be, be a part of my circle. Um, so it started really just myself and really connecting to my Chandra Sadhana for me, my intuition, like you said, um, my ojas, my, my yin and, um, as many of us are these like strong women, I feel like there's this like strong woman sort of archetype, right? And we're all hitting our thirties. Like I need to get more in touch with the feminine sides of myself, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> so, so then it started being like circling with my brujas and my, my women and, and my circle and then it started, okay, well, I'm teaching this to clients to do their work. And then I started teaching moon and womb or, you know, women's rituals and moon phases for a few years and so many different ways, like a, a half day workshop to like an online, like in Shakti school, I teach it in level one and really craving like, okay, it's one thing to teach this stuff. So I definitely teach what are the energetics of the various parts of the moon phases? How do they affect us emotionally? How do they affect us physically? What are the benefits of Chandra Sadhana when we look at the pathophysiology of disease from an Ayurvedic picture? Um, and how is it that Chandra Sadhana affects all of these things and how we can use it to our advantage so in teaching that i really started having this craving of like okay this is really cool information but how about we feel it and we go through it together and so that's where one moon cycle together was born and so literally we start on the dark moon and we move through one moon cycle together and we meet four times and we do the practices together so i get to lead meditation and we get to feel the energy of that particular phase so it just evolved into this thing and, and I love it so for me it really does feel like okay this is part of my dharma to connect women to that inner guidance that they have within and chandra sadhana is a powerful way to bring them into that so it's a super low cost circle that's it's like 40 dollars or something like that and once you're in you're in and so literally like twice a year we just plug back in together do some rituals together refresh ourselves on the practice and and come back in and the circle just keeps growing and so it's really it's really just a fun, it's a passion project, you know what I mean? But, um, but it's really fun. So, so I'd encourage you guys to join my circle and do it with me. And obviously the audience is invited too, but yeah, so that's how I do it. I love that. And, and either like a theme that's showing up in the circle or even just in general with some of the clients that you work with, um, what are some trends you're seeing across the emotional body, um, and just, yeah, just in general. Yeah, well, definitely when it comes to emotions, the most common theme is that everybody grew up in a family or a household where no one really knew what to do with emotions, at least nothing healthy. So you've got the spectrum, but there's the 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 sort of house of like emotions weren't acknowledged or put on the table or considered valid or appropriate or and it wasn't really okay to have unpleasant emotions or extreme emotions house right to the um very dysregulated sort of dysfunctional extreme emotional expression dynamics where it's like not really everything's okay ever <laughs> You're like nothing's really ever okay rather right so those are the two houses that i feel like 
all of us can sort of relate to being, you know, and there's a spectrum, of course, but you already know, just as soon as I said that, like, yeah. which house was your family, you know, and you can have both too, right? It could be like, it, it's like this normally, and then about every three weeks it goes here, right? <laughs> we know. <laughs> But so those are like the, that's where everybody's coming from. So what I'm working with people on is first, let's learn how to feel because a lot of people have turned that off. And I can't tell you how many times I tell people like, okay, well, so how do you feel about that? And they're telling me, well, I thought this, but then this, and then da, 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 blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, great. But those are your thoughts. How do you feel? Like if I were to pull out one of those kindergarten feeling charts, <laughs> what are some feeling words, you know? And it's it's challenging for a lot of people in the beginning. It was for me even, you know? And or I was just like, oh, I'm always irritated. <laughs> like I had one feeling that I was like in touch with. <laughs> so learning how to feel is definitely one phase of work we do. Then the next phase is working through, okay, once you do have an unpleasant feeling that comes around, how do we understand that it's really just how the emotional body is communicating to the mental awareness that there is an emotional need that is not being met, right? So when I get to a red light when I'm driving, I'm not sitting at the red light being like, oh shit, like here I am, I'm at a red light again. Why did I do this? How did I get here? Oh, it must've been because I did this, this, this. How long is this gonna last? Why can't I get around this? Here is what all this is gonna cause for me to be at this red light right now. I'm such a blah, 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 insert the blank for being at this red light. Like we don't do that, but we do all of that when we come to a red light emotion, so to speak, or an unpleasant emotion, which is really just a red light from the emotional body saying, not this way, no, this is not the way, you know? <laughs> and so instead to really like teach people, don't waste time with all of that reaction to the unpleasant emotion, right? And what we're taught to do is to just medicate it or meditate it, you know? It's also totally not really getting to the root of why we're getting this message to just sit there and be like, oh, I just meditated for 30 minutes. Okay, well, that's great that it calmed yourself. There's, you know, like drop the emotional intensity and the valence and maybe allowed you to get like, get out of your sympathetic nervous system or, you know, out of your limbic system a little bit. That's wonderful, but it's not getting to the root of what is the unmet emotional need and giving you the clarity on how to proceed differently that's missing. And so that's, that's something I see a lot in sort of like holistic health or like, you know, positive new age sort of spirituality stuff. Right. So the learning to feel being really in touch with what you're feeling, not getting stuck in what you're feeling and being able to really decipher decode or come to the core unmet emotional needs that are being messaged or revealed by those unpleasant feelings, learning how to strategize and engage the mental body to um, actually meet those emotional needs and even to meet them yourself instead of depending on others to meet them. That's a big thing in partnerships, relationships, friendships, family, work. <laughs> um, and then learning to understand your psycho-spiritual spiral and the greater context of your emotional background and to acknowledge that greater context, like, okay, like I'm here, I'm at, I'm at a low point. This is not a place from which I'm going to solve, or I know this is part of why I'm having this reactivity and it emphasizes, underscores these unmet emotional needs that I'm already aware of. So instead of reacting in this moment, let me focus on meeting those emotional needs first and then bring myself back up to the top of my you know, spiral and then solve and attract solutions from a grounded sort of good feeling place these kinds of like greater context practices, I think come next. So it's almost like I could break that down into these phases. They're all overlapping, but those four are essential components of working with people to really come into, okay, like 
I'm actually using my emotions as probably the most powerful internal guidance system. And there's, there's nothing like it. There's, there's like, there's no other way to feel like you are where you're supposed to be. And like, you feel like you have faith or that you're getting self-validation. There's, there's nothing better than that. You're just like speaking directly <laughs> to our, in our hearts and souls of like what we love to preach so much. I'm just like, Yes, 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 yes. Like nodding bobblehead over yeah, here. Yeah, like, like going crazy, like about to get whiplash. But I, because I, I literally just, I can relate to this. I had a consult with one of my one-on-ones a couple weeks ago, the same exact thing. So she got triggered by something by her partner. And she's like, I did all the rituals that we had. Like I meditated and I like went up. She's like, I did it all. And like, it was, you know, I still didn't feel great. Like what happened? And it's like, I think as women, we still kind of can have this like Western approach to it. Like I took the medication, I took the supplement, I took the herb, I took the meditation, but it still didn't work. And it's like, that's because you didn't actually feel the emotion behind it for you. It wasn't safe to feel that emotion. And as women, I think we can have this tendency to think that it's not safe to feel the emotion and like you said it all comes down to that once you just trust your emotions always as like the compass of guiding you back to the path of your intuition like that's truly what it's all about it can be simple it doesn't have to be this crazy thing i think that's what the mind makes it more complicated than it has to be yeah and and that's interesting about the safe to feel the emotion like yeah i think definitely we're just learning that oh, it's okay to be angry or it's okay to be sad or it's okay to whatever. But also, I don't think personally it's worthwhile to stay in that vibrational frequency either. So personally, I want to be able to acknowledge like, this is making me feel this way and I'm feeling this way. But then I want to get to what are my unmet emotional needs and let me build the clarity and um, start aligning my words and my actions to meet those emotional needs, immediately the unpleasant feeling dissipates. And I, I want to get out of that because I don't want to continue attracting people, situations, experiences from that frequency as well. So not to say that like we should run from our emotions, but also just being real that like, I don't want to stay in a place of being frustrated or sad or whatever, whatever, when I have the tools to receive the message of that emotion, to acknowledge it, to validate it, and then to move forward and have it released. Totally. Yeah. And maybe that's why like in this polarized society where it feels like it has to be like black or white or left or right, it's like, it's a dance between the two of those. It like doesn't have to be one or the other. It's finding that sacred union between both of them. Yeah. Like what I like to say for myself is like, okay, you know, I will go through the experience of feeling this really unpleasant emotion with myself, with my journal maybe in like two conversations with loved ones that are helping me to process or soundboard, e basta. You know, like that's my personal cutoff because otherwise I'm just perpetuating that experience. And I don't want to keep talking about the what is either. I want to do it enough to get clear about the what is so I know where it's guiding me, where it's directing me. And then... <laughs> Yeah. And I think it's interesting. Um, like I know there's a piece of science that says it takes like 90 seconds to feel an emotion and it's such a short amount of time, but when you're in it, I feel like for me, at least that 90 seconds feels like forever where I'll do anything to avoid it. Like I'll analyze it. Like even when journaling, it's like I'll write around it, trying to like intellectualize the emotion and to realize that the 90 seconds is so short. And then I can just like move the hell on with my life. Right. But <laughs> there's that fear of being in it where I have to like really take myself to the bathroom or sit down and be like, you're angry. It's okay. Like, let's just be angry for this minute and a half. Like you can survive <laughs> this and then like moving on right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I still do that so I'm, I'm really guilty of that but <laughs> um I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on just in general and I, I always love hearing this from people like the future of Ayurveda of holistic medicine and 
maybe even how like allopathic medicine fits in there. Like if you see them coming together, if you see them being separate or like, what do you see as the future of, you know, kind of the path we're on? Oh, that's a fun question. You know, it's really interesting. Like with Ayurveda, I think like Katie and I are definitely part of that sort of leading edge of, of the evolution because Shakti school and like all of the clients and students that I've been blessed to work with, we're just growing and growing and growing in this sort of divine feminine form version of Ayurveda. So that is definitely where I see Ayurveda going. I think that like with Western medicine, there will be a polarization and a, a sort of separation of that, right? Where like the traditional kind of identify the sub doshas and hit this marma point and blah, 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 like the rules, right? Will segment off um, and, you know, it was like, everything that became not very rote physical was kind of taken out of allopathic medicine. So to remember anthropologically, Ayurveda is what traveled sort of north through imami, you know, kind of like the mogul forms of medicine up into Greece, which then evolved into the humoric medicine, which is the basis of sort of modern mess like western medicine today right like we still take the hippocratic oath it came from humoric medicine that was not a purely physical representation it did become polarized and then sort of separated out and you know you can understand the pressures of the separatization separatization definitely had to do with trying to like t the patriarchal view of like we want to create a quality standard and we want to keep everybody safe. So we got to put everything into these algorithms and we have the DSM and, you know, then that combined with sort of the medical industrial complex pressures of like what makes money. The only things that I can offer you if you come to my office as a doctor is either a diagnostic test or a pharmaceutical drug. And these are the only two things that make money. That's not a coincidence, right? Like I went to one of the top 10 med schools in the United States, which is supposedly like a good place to go to med school. We didn't have a nutrition class. Yeah, it's it, crazy. This was, like I'm not that old that that shouldn't have been a place. <laughs> so, so I think this fragmentation responds to those pressures, right? But what I see is that there are a lot of people like me and all the people that support me and come to study with me or work with me that don't give a damn about the rules and the way anymore. And they can't contain us. Like I'm not an Ayurvedic practitioner and neither am I a doctor, even though I have the training for both. I am me. Do you know what I'm saying? And there's no one that can stop me from, from practicing what I practice if there is a demand. Do you see what I'm saying? And the demand is rising. So I don't think it's going to be able to be checked or contained. The many variations that we're going to see coming forward within Ayurveda, I don't see that Western medicine is going to stand on purely physical legs very much longer because we're already seeing a trend like every single major medical center now almost has an integrative health or, you know, sort of alternative branch or entity or advisory or program, right? Because the demand is driving it, right? And so something that I've been saying also recently is my personal definition of modern medicine um, that I'm putting out there now is very much so an Ayurvedic approach, even though it's not Ayurvedic and it's about access. Like the one thing that makes modern times unique is our access, right? So the fact that I can access 
access bars, Reiki, biomagnetism, bioenergetic, frequency, diverters, herbs, diet, massage, what like CAT scans is like, unlike any other time that we've ever lived in. Do you know what I'm saying? And so if I am not curating my healthcare to me and my experience of my disease or imbalances, that's not modern medicine. So that's my new definition of modern medicine. Um, and that's where I see it going. And so Ayurveda, it's, it's probably not even something that I'm going to necessarily like keep branding myself with because people don't get that really what's underneath that is the fluidity and that the thing we've been talking about this whole show that the customization that happens, the individualization, the context specific curation of the response or the shift of the pattern right and and that's where i see that we're heading and so it will be no longer that you're choosing allopathic or natural that's just not a thing anymore right and it, it won't also be that you're just choosing ayurveda no like you're going to be choosing every modality and curating it to yourself and i think the practitioners of the future are all going to be multimodal and really their gift is going to be in helping you curate your specific response. And that's definitely what I'm doing because I refer people all the time for, oh, acupuncture would be great for this. Like you should really use microcurrent for that. Or, you know, have you tried this for this? And yeah. That's so exciting. And I, I love that vision for the way forward. And I think that's so helpful for people, not only having access to all of the tools, but then also being able to navigate intuitively, like, you know, you're giving those recommendations, but then also being able to say that for myself, like I'm going to seek out this healer and then maybe go to this practice and try this on my own. And hopefully that that's, you know, a positive way forward that drives way more results than what we've seen thus far, which is super, super exciting. And this has just been an, an amazing conversation. Um, I know me personally, I feel like I have 50 more questions, so this could <laughs> go on for a very we'll long time. We'd love to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> we would love that. We would absolutely love that. Um, but I'd love for you to share where listeners can find you, your moon circle, your book, all of the things, work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, where's the best place to find you and work with you? Absolutely. So um, my website is Ayurveda by Siva. So A-Y-U-R-V-E-D-A. B Y and then Siva is S I V A dot com. And right there on the homepage is um, my mentorship program for people who are in Ayurveda, yoga therapy, and such, and want to start a practice that is actually tailored to their own patterns and, and curated to what is energetically beneficial for them, which I haven't seen anywhere. Um, right there, um, also all my workshops and programs like the one moon cycle together in the spring. There's one on like setting up the basics of your Ayurvedic lifestyle. It's called food, sex, sleep. Um, so programs are all there. The book is there. Um, my intro to Ayurvedic course is there. Uh, private sessions with me are there. Everything's there. Awesome. We will link that in the show notes and it'll be super easy for everyone to access. So thank you so much for coming on the show, for your wisdom, for your insights into the future. Looking forward to it. And um, everyone, we will see you next week. Uh, thanks for having me, ladies. This is a super fun conversation.